because I listened to that second Billy Idol album, and there's so much going on in the guitar realm that I don't think anybody really talks to you about because, you know, at the time, you had Pyromania that came out in January. Right. And then you had Billy Idol, Rebel Yell, that came out, what, November, I think, of 83? That's right, yeah, yeah. November. So yeah. at the time, in my mind, the only people mm. that were doing really cool orchestrated guitar parts like that was Def Leppard and you. Yeah, I mean, this was, uh, you know, <clears throat> we started recording that record in uh, late 83. And, um, <clears throat> the, you know, keyboards were all the rage. It was new wave and all this yeah. kind of stuff. And I was I was not going to let keyboards on the record. <laughs> so I had to be inventive with my guitar stuff. And I made a deal with our producer, Keith Forsey. I said, let me try and do on the guitar what we would imagine a keyboard doing. And if it sucks, you know, no, no harm done. Then you bring in the keyboards. <laughs> Just wipe the and tape I, and we'll do it again. Yeah. And, um, and fortunately it gave the record a, a kind of a unique edge uh, because a lot of the guitar stuff was, you know, more than just a heavy rock thing or whatever. And, you know, it was really the, 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 the sum of the parts, Billy obviously coming from the punk rock thing in, in, in London started at the same time as the Sex Pistols with Generation X. Yeah. Our producer, Keith, was <clears throat> had worked with Giorgio Moroder and did those Donna Summers records. So he's like a dance disco guy. So you and got influences would, from all over the place. Exactly. And we all brought our specialties, I think. And, uh, you know, not only did I have the folk thing, but, I, you know, I was learning electric guitar at the height of the English rock guitar guys like Brian May and, you know, Zeppelin was going and The Who and yeah. uh, and all this stuff. So I had all this kind of, you know, it was great, a great time to pick up the guitar. Yeah. I mean, especially, you don't. so you grew up listening to those kind of bands. Like you grew up listening to Zeppelin and, and The yeah. Queen. So those were your influences. Right. Anything out of England. There was yeah. a um, <clears throat> WNEW in New York had a show every Friday called Things from England. And it's funny, it had such an impact on me because I'd listen. It was a two hour show. I'd listen and then go to the department store and buy these English imports. <laughs> and I've recently heard Paul Stanley talk about exactly that. He was listening to that same show and getting all the English imports and stuff. So uh, yeah. really influential on on us New York kids at that time. Was it was the Raspberries an English band or were they American? American. Yeah, they were yeah, American. But so, so inspired by... By the UK. Uh, you know, a lot of Beatles and, you know, kind of uh, uh, zombies and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I want Talking about your guitar work on those albums, you know, you were one of the first to kind of have a really, really processed guitar sound. I mean, it was, you know, Rebel Yell was done in, in Electric Lady, Hendrix Studio. Yeah. And back then, you know, the, this was the days of big budget albums, so we had Lockout. So... I was so inspired, man. I mean, you know, I grew up in New York and as a kid, I used to go to the movie theater next to Electric Lady, you know, to see uh, Kids Are All Right or a rock film or whatever. <laughs> they had the all night rock. And here I am, I'm in the damn studio and I never left the place. And I just like, me and the engineer, just like, we had a field day. And a lot of the effects and things that were coming out then were all new and yeah. um, it was an exciting time for, for, for gear. So what was the main what was what was the main uh, amp that you used on that on that album? Because it almost sounds like are you using like a Rockman on there or a couple of tracks of Rockman? Um, yeah. Not not that I, you know, what happened was we actually recorded a lot of the tracks before we had a real drummer. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, because it's a lot of Lindrum on that album, right? Right. So we were looking for a drummer. So some of the guitar tracks, Blue Highway. Uh, was done with a rock man. I always said I wanted to replace it, but oh, no, it know. sounds great. Why would you do that? <laughs> I mean, I guess it, you know it is of the time. You know, it, it you know. Yeah. Now I look at it and go, yeah, I guess it's okay. But at the time, but but the main guitar amp was one that I uh, <clears throat> I had since be, the band I was in before Billy Idol. Mm. I used to build pedal boards for guys, and one of the guys gave me this vintage amp, and uh, actually had Jim Marshall's signature on the inside of the cabinet. Ooh. So it was a, yeah, it was a, a early 70. I got lucky. I didn't, you know, got this amp and uh, I still have it, still record with it. Nice. And it's a little good luck charm. Yeah. I mean, that it doesn't get more legit than that. You got the man's signature inside it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. so you, you did a, you use a Rockman on a couple of those tracks, but you know, I'm, listen to the guitar 
arrangements on the album though because there's a lot going on and it's you and as soon as I hear it like I I hear you like that is how you sound and that's your tone but and you said that you wanted to replace the Rockman sound but what's in my mind you know a lot of people talk about modern sounding records and I mm -hmm. think every rock band that puts out an album now it all sounds the same they're all using the same drum plugins they're all using the same virtual amps. Everything sounds the same. So when you hear a classic album like that and that classic guitar tone, I think it's awesome that it has a distinctive, recognizable sound right away. Yeah, I mean, that's th this was the days of guitar players had to find a unique voice and yeah. all of those, you know, and I, hopefully I'm one of those guys who like, you know, you strive to, to have, to be able to play three notes and people go, I know who that, I mean, whether you think Neil Young is brilliant or crap, you hear three <laughs> notes of him. I think he's brilliant, but you hear three notes and you go, "That's Neil Young," right. and um, and that's that's uh, you know, and and, and uh, same with Kurt Cobain. You know, not terribly te te technique savvy, but you know it's him. And I think that's the most important thing. Uh, it goes for singers as well. Sometimes you know, a singer may not have the greatest range or greatest pitch, but I mean, Dylan is the perfect example. Or Hendrix, they're not trained singers, but you know it's them and it's yeah. the emotion behind it. It was, you know, making making records at that point, it was, uh, I think maybe because I was in New York, <clears throat> I was away from the kind of L.A., you know, I loved Van Halen. I was aware yeah. of Eddie and all that stuff, but I was away from all the other guys who kind of were in the wake of, you know, everybody wanted to sound like Van Halen right. if they if they were from L.A. or what. But in New York, uh, it wasn't as big a thing. Uh, and uh, and we still had the kind of street, you know, we still loved Kiss and New York Dolls. Yeah. And all well, of New, our York New York is a very, you know, punk town, you know, everything from the right. dictators to, uh, exactly. you know, dancing in the exactly. misfits. Yeah, I mean, the thing that bonded Billy and I, because when we first met, you know, here's this punk rock guy and here's me kind of influenced by a lot of the bands that punk was not, a, you know, was kind of like breaking down. Yeah. But we bonded over over Lou Reed because I I knew all those Lou Reed songs and stuff. So nice. that was kind of, oh, OK, I see some common ground here. Let's say Rebel Yell came out today. Right. What do you think the world would have thought of it and how do you think it would have been I mean, received? So, who knows? I mean, it's so different now, though. You know, and also we had that. The, but at the end of the day, isn't a good song a good song? Yeah, but we had a we had a platform for it, right? With with MTV and that video, that live video of of Rebel Yell really permeated the masses. And when we went out on tour, the audiences wanted to replicate what the audience was doing in the video. So yeah. it's it telegraphed something about how you know because we was when we started that tour we were still playing clubs and eventually went to arenas and uh that was the record that broke the uh, billy idol but those those videos were really in everybody's uh you know uh, home yeah in everybody's house yeah and i mean at the end of the day i guess mtv and radio is really the platform for you to yeah, become famous but, but i'm proud i'm proud to say you know even if i'm driving and i hear rebel yell come on um, it still sounds good, you know, it's... Well, I it's, don't think it... I personally don't think it sounds dated at all. I mean, like, you know, you mentioned that the guitar tone might be a little dated in a sense, but, you know, I was listening to our local rock station, uh, right. and they were playing a new song from this uh, this new band, but then they played another one from a new band, and then another uh -huh. one from a new band, and everybody is going back to this organic kind of 70s-ish homage kind of production, but right. if you listen to the pop radio, everybody's doing the 80s thing. You listen to The Weeknd. You listen to Dua Lipa. Everybody's going back to Absolutely, yeah. So why Absolutely. do you th what do you think it is about the about the rock scene that everybody's sort of afraid to go back to those processed drums and big guitars and, you know, cannonball snares? Like, what what's the stigma around the music that people are... Well, it's, you know, uh, Billy Idol has always had one foot in rock and one foot in pop. yeah. Yeah, we were definitely trying to 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 create singles and 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 uh, memorable tunes. A lot of the tunes were, you know, why should we put a guitar solo on it? Is there a reason for it? And if there is going to be a guitar solo, uh, it, it it better reflect the message of the song rather than just for the sake of putting a guitar solo on it. Right. 
no, that makes total sense. And that's kind of like the Mutt Lang approach at the same time as well. Right. Yeah. You know? And it's interesting that you would say Mutt because both Mutt and Keith Forsey, Keith being a drummer, the attention to detail and sometimes drove me crazy because you had to lock into the groove and us like Def Leppard, we were, we were, were uh, recording uh, to a grid, to a click. Right. And uh, a lot of rock records back then weren't. No. So, so we were able to do edits and extended dance remixes like Def Leppard did. Uh, whereas a lot of the rock bands from there, they, they, they didn't think about any of that no. sort of stuff. Not at all. And it's, I, I mentioned that because, you know, you listen to, Rebel Yell, and then you listen to Pyromania, and it's it's kind of yeah. got the same kind of you know production aspect to it as at the same yeah, time. Yeah, the attention to detail and groove. It's got so the much under, groove. Yeah, the underneath groove is is you, you, you know that was always the thing. Get the motor and the cement and the the foundation solid, and then you can build on it. Yeah, you know, so no slop. When you were doing that album, you know, you, a lot of it was the Lindrum. So would you have a drum pattern and then you'd play to that? Or did you have a riff or, you know, you listen to something like, uh, like daytime drama or something, you know, did, uh, did. Well, on Rebel Yell, Keith Forsey did all the Lindrum programming. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, uh, and he, he was brilliant at it. He was an early adoptee of it. And uh, so we kind of knew which songs needed the real drums, Rebel Yell, mm -hmm. real, real drums, Blue Highway, real drums. Um but things like Flesh for Fantasy, you know, obviously needed a, 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 a perfect drum, yeah. dance drum yeah. thing to it. Needed that sequencing so the to it. Needed it. Yeah. No, that makes total sense. I like it. You know, I like stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I've always liked, like, you know, there's no rules, man. There's no, you know, you try stuff and and see if it works. And, and half of the, you know, what I always tell guitar players, you know, budding guitar players are you know, doing these uh, online classes for rock and roll fantasy camp now. Right. And I tell people, it's not really what you know, it's the mistakes that you make so that you don't do yeah. that again. No, totally. That's how you get knowledge. It's, you have to screw up to, <laughs> you know, to do. And we screwed up a lot, man. <laughs> hey, it's trial and error at the end of the day. You, you can't innovate without making some mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes are what make things you stumble upon, you, we always said the beautiful mistake, you stumble upon something and you go, that's, that's the hook. And you go, what? And they go, roll the tape back. What? what? Oh, I wasn't even thinking about that. Do that again. And they're like, the hook. oh, it wasn't recorded. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah.